Is the 70 series still really a 70 now it's got four cylinder power? Is this 2.8 plus automatic? Is it as good as the old V8 or dare I say it, is it even better? Now this car is the 2024 76 series Land Cruiser and in this video I want to run you through everything that you need to know about this car if you are looking at one. Listen, it's expensive, it's slow, it hasn't got much in terms of tech and it's very rudimentary to drive. But there's no denying this is a very special car and it's on the top of the list for a lot of Australian buyers for emotional reasons and I'm fully on board with that. And to review this car, we're gonna put it through its paces in its home environment as well. Out in the bush, camping, four wheel driving and time on the open road. We're gonna see what this thing's made of. Let's get stuck into it. The car is slipping slightly. And I've done it. Oh, f that, f that, f that, f that. The 2024 Toyota Land Cruiser 76 Series now starts from $75,600 plus on road costs. And that's for the Workmate spec with the four cylinder diesel and six speed automatic transmission. Now, this is an increase of $4,600 over the prices in 2023, which used to have only the choice of a diesel V8 and five-speed manual transmission. Our tester here, though, is GXL spec, which is priced from $79,800 plus on-road costs. Opting for a V8 in this spec will add an extra $4,100 to the asking price. In this spec, we get a 6.7-inch infotainment display with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, two extra USB-C power outlets, a 4.2-inch multifunction display, 16-inch alloy wheels and LED headlights. There's also updated safety credentials in this new Land Cruiser with autonomous emergency braking, lane departure warning, traffic sign recognition and even a reversing camera in this wagon-style 76 series body. The 2.8-litre turbocharged diesel four-cylinder engine is borrowed from the Hilux, Fortuna and Land Cruiser Prado and here it makes 150 kilowatts and 500 newton meters. It runs through a six-speed automatic gearbox of the same origins and has the same old part-time four-wheel drive system of the 70 series for many years. There's a low-range transfer case here and the GXL spec picks up locking differentials front and rear. So GXL specification is the most money you can spend on a 76 series, unless of course you get a V8, because that's more expensive again. But what do you get on the outside? Firstly, this raised air intake. Some people call it a snorkel. It's not really technically. This is still the same old three piece design. So there's one piece here and there's one piece here, and then there's another piece on the inside. So it's not fully water sealed. It definitely helps in terms of going through river crossings and that sort of thing, but I wouldn't depend on this 100%. Replace it or seal it up or something like that. Another thing you'll notice in recent years for the 70 series are these massive indicators on the side. They're actually really, really big. And that's because the 70 series went above three and a half tons in terms of GVM a few years ago. Now that was for a few reasons to sidestep some crash safety rules to allow this car to stay on sale. You also get an increased payload so it's not a bad thing but the indicators well they're bloody huge and it's one of those things it's when you see them you can't really unsee them anymore. Another thing you can't unsee definitely I don't think it's a bad thing either is the new look of this car. We've got new headlights here, they're a round style. They're also LED, so definitely more powerful than what they replace. You've got a raised bonnet as well. This thing feels really, really high, even before you do things like tires and suspension lifts and the heritage style grille. Now that's just standard fitment these days because well, every Tom, Dick and Harry was putting those on anyway, aftermarket or genuine. Now walk around to this side. GXL also gets 16 inch alloy wheels. The Workmate gets a 16 inch steel wheel with a slightly taller but narrower tire. These are a Dunlop Grand Trek. They're not a bad setup really, to be honest, in terms of standard kit, but I don't doubt that a lot of people will be throwing these in the bin very, very quickly for aftermarket bits and bobs. Now, in terms of size overall, this 76 series is effectively the smallest Land Cruiser in the range. It's on the shortest wheelbase overall in comparison to the Troopy, the single cab and the dual cab, but you've got room for five on there. So it's a little bit more of a traditional layout. 
However, even though we have gone away from eight cylinder power in this 70 series Land Cruiser, we still have that discrepancy in wheel track between front and rear. So the rear is noticeably wider and you've got a narrowness in the back. There are performance issues there, but for me, it's also just the car feels a little bit like a half baked job in my opinion. It doesn't look right and it just doesn't feel right, especially when you're spending this kind of money. So at the back of the 70 series, not a whole lot has changed overall. This is kind of the same car pretty much in comparison to what you got back in 2007. You do have two doors here, one smaller side is handy, I suppose, for chucking smaller things in and not operating this big heavier side with that spare on the back. And well, the boot is probably not as impressive as you first might imagine. We've got a lot of camping gear wedged in here at the moment, which works out okay, but you do need to use the vertical space as much as you can, the width and the length, because it's not actually that big, especially when you look at the car from the outside. There's not a whole lot of features going on in there either. Can't really see it at the moment, but don't worry, you're not missing out on much. It's just a raw load space. Now, let me close this up. Don't get it the wrong way because you will damage something. Now, one other thing I want to show you with this car. Now, you might notice here a little bit of damage on the back of the 70 Series Land Cruiser. It does happen on press cars from time to time, but I'm glad to say that this actually wasn't my doing. I was in the car at the time. This vehicle was at the national press launch for the new 2024 70 Series Land Cruiser, and we had a guy from Toyota called Mick driving, an extremely skilled driver, actually, and he drove this car up some really serious terrain, and it did it really well. I think a lot of it was the driver, to be honest with you, but I remember the exact moment when this went pop up a big rock step. The car did fine, just did a little bit of dragging of the bum there, but these things happen. Now, that was all fun, but I am interested in doing my own testing in this video, and I've got some really cool tracks in mind. Hopefully, I don't add to the damage bill on this car. So what's new on the inside of this updated 70 series? One big thing for me is extra storage, especially if you opt for the four cylinder and this six speed automatic transmission, because you've got an auto here now, instead of the big manual gear shifter, you've actually got a console that has some storage built in. Two cup holders, nice big spot here, that works well for your phone, even an extra little slot there. So this just feels a lot more practical for everyday usage in comparison to the old 70 series, which was pretty much empty in this area now the v8 does get a little bit of extra stuff here but not as much as the auto you also get some extra power outlets so there's a 12 volt there a couple of usb-c power outlets and there's also a usb-a up here on the infotainment display now that is for doing your mirroring but there's also a fair amount of power that comes out of that and because you've got auto here you've also got hill descent control a power hall button for changing the throttle map and also a second gear start button as well because this is a little bit more technologically advanced than the previous generation. But at the same time, there are some familiar things here. So the general dash, the layout, the ergonomics, that's all the same story as it used to be. And good old fashioned mechanical air conditioning controls. This feels like a real blast from the past these days. I actually don't mind it personally. It's got a nice uh, mechanical feel. It probably won't break down too often, but that is straight out of the mid 1980s, I think. Now, in terms of other storage, you've got a center console here, which feels surprisingly flimsy i have to say the lid i reckon if i twisted that enough it would probably break off but let's jump in here and have a look storage is pretty good you've got a bin on top for keeping things organized that's not too bad pop that back in so it is useful but just for a car that feels otherwise really robust overall that just feels a bit cheap and rubbish i think but otherwise we've got a different in instrument cluster in front here You've got a little trip computer there on the side and buttons on the steering wheel. So you can actually look at things like digital speed readout. You've got your lane keep assistance technology there and also things like how much fuel you've got, how much fuel you're using. This is stuff that the 70 series hasn't had before. So definitely feels a little bit more modern with this steering wheel. I think it's come from a Toyota Hilux maybe. So overall, there are some updates here. There are some upgrades, but it's the same old Land Cruiser that we either love or hate. All right, before I talk about space and comfort, I just want to run you through all the modern features that you get in the second row of this 70 series. All right, with that out of the way, let's talk about space and comfort because let's be honest, there isn't a whole lot going on here. So the usual test here, that's my driving position up front there. I'm a little bit under six foot tall. And here, as you can see, there isn't a whole lot of space going on. I've heard people refer to this car as being a reverse TARDIS on the inside because it looks really big 
on the outside, but once you get in, you're actually surprised by how little space there is. It's surprisingly cramped in comparison to most modern day vehicles. Modern day cars don't have to worry about ladder chassis and body on frame construction and all those things that this car has. It is a cramped experience. I don't have any power outlets. I don't have any air vents. I don't even have any top tether points for putting kids seats into the back here. So if you actually wanted to use this for putting kids in the back, you'd have to get something engineered. So you'd be dipping back into your pocket to make that work. You do have rubber floor mats here. It does feel durable. You've got this same seat material that I feel like it's been around for such a long time. It does tend to carry marks a little bit easier than you might expect, but I don't know, it's real classic, isn't it? It does tug at the heartstrings a little bit, but otherwise, not a whole lot going on here in terms of space or features. In many respects, this Land Cruiser 70 series is the same old vehicle we either love or hate. And it hasn't changed a whole lot really since the mid 1980s. We've got coil springs up front now. There's been a bunch of different engines and gearboxes that have come through. And of course, this four cylinder is the latest iteration of that. But a lot of the stuff is fairly familiar. So firstly, steering feel, general driving capability around town. Steering is very slow, both in terms of the ratio, how much you have to turn the wheel to do a three point turn, but also just the feel of response as you turn. If you're coming from more sedans, more monocoque based SUVs, you're gonna get a rude shock when you drive this thing. But if you come from this part of the world, generally speaking, this will just be par for the course, I suppose. It's because this has a live axle up front. It's a really rare thing to have in four wheel drives these days. The 70 series Land Cruiser retains it, and it just means it feels a bit agricultural to drive. Hear that noise there? That is something relatively new for the 70 series as well. That is lane departure warning. It's not too overly bearing either, which is good. I just picked up on it then as we're driving along the country road, but I probably was too far in the center. So it's fairly accurate. It doesn't go too far over the top, but there is no lane keep assist or anything like that. So it's a fairly rudimentary system. You also get traffic sign recognition, but thankfully that's a very quiet system in this car. So it's not binging and bonging at you all the time, but the information is there for you to reference as you're driving around. So there has been some more safety equipment added to the 70 series Land Cruiser, but it's still at a fairly rudimentary level. Like the rest of the car, it is kind of in keeping with what this car is all about. Now you will hear a bit of camping gear rattling around in the back of this car at the moment. We are currently on our way out into the bush, but what you might not hear and something that you will get if you've got a snorkel fitted, especially, is a lot of wind noise. This car isn't a quiet vehicle to drive, so you can hear a fair bit of what's going on. This 2.8, I think it's quieter than the V8 by a fair stretch, but it's more road noise and wind noise that you tend to pick up on in this car. This engine, listen, I've got to split my opinion with this engine in two different camps, I think. The rational side, it's faster, it's easier to get up to speed, it's more efficient, and it's quieter. It's a better choice in every sense. But on the other side of my brain, this is the emotional side, and this engine vibrates a lot. There is no thong slap going on here. It doesn't have the same sort of soundtrack available, and it's just nowhere near as charming in the way it goes about its business. So I love the V8, but if you actually use the rational part of your brain, this four cylinder is the better choice. It's easier to drive, it gets up to speed around town, and you'll notice that it holds speeds a lot better and easier, even though it's missing a lot of capacity. Just This just feels punchier. So, you know what? If you wanna buy the V8, I totally get it, but if you're considering the four cylinder, give it a test drive because you might be surprised. Now, another thing to talk about with this 70 series, and this is one thing that hasn't changed in decades, is the ride quality. We've still got leaf springs in the back and we've got a relatively narrow track in the back there as well. And the 70 series, it's got a big payload, it's got a big towing capacity, it's got a big GVM. This is a heavy duty vehicle and that means it does need to have relatively stiff suspension. So don't expect good absorption. This will probably go through more potholes than any other car on the planet before it runs into issues but you will feel those potholes when you bump into them. So that's just par for the course, I think, in the territory of this kind of car. The ride quality is nowhere near 
other vehicles that are new in the current market. Now, before we discuss and test out this off-road capability, it is worth pointing out the workhorse credentials of this Land Cruiser and the reason why that ride quality might be a little bit disappointing. Where a lot of four-wheel drive wagons on the Australian market might be limited in terms of payload and towing capacities, the 76 series shines in this regard. The payload is actually a massive 1,210 kilograms and you've got a three and a half ton brake to towing capacity as well. But throw in the 7,010 kilo gross combination mass and this really stands head and shoulders above other four wheel drive wagons in the payload capacity department. So it doesn't feel completely at home on the black top but maybe that will change when we get deeper into the bush and do some four wheel driving. Let's see how we go. General off-road ground clearance is pretty good here and the relatively shorter wheelbase of the 76 series in comparison to the ute and the troop carrier gives it a little bit of extra maneuverability. The crawl ratio of this four-cylinder Land Cruiser is 38.5 to 1, which is not as deep as the V8, and you don't have as much compression braking available. However, having an automatic gearbox is definitely an advantage over the manual in more challenging off-road driving. And apologies in advance for the screeching noise you might hear. It's actually a rock in the brakes. It was stuck in behind the backing plate, but we were able to fish it out a little bit later when we got to camp. All right, we've got a challenging little section of track up here. Some ruts, it's pretty steep and it's a fairly loose sort of dusty track. So this will be a little bit of a challenge, I think, for this 70 series Land Cruiser. Let's see how we go. In low range at the moment, no diff locks, however. Just want to see how this car travels without those before I engage them. Of course, GXL gets diff locks as standard front and rear. So quite a rare offering. In this day and age, I've got to say, this Land Cruiser doesn't feel particularly st stable. It doesn't articulate much. So I've got to really drive through these wheel lifts. Nah, I'm going to go back, I think. That's a bit too sketchy for me. Now, I do want to ease into things a little bit here, not go too crazy. I'm up over that bit there with a little bit of a change of angle and then keep the traction going here hopefully. Alright so now I'm going to stop there and flick on the magic buttons front and rear diff lock and I'm just going to see if I can drive forward nice and slow they've turned on straight away nice engagement there now this thing's driving forward nice and easy look at that just going to watch these side angles so there are some pretty big holes here i'm driving through oh look at that it's done it diff locks amazing bits of equipment it almost feels like cheating actually because it just makes it so much easier but there you go this 70 series it doesn't have the best suspension out of the box in comparison to other off-roaders. There's a Jeep Wrangler, for example. It's got much better off-road suspension, but obviously it's got no payload or towing capacity. This Land Cruiser kind of has to play both sides of the street in that regard. Clearance is pretty good, not amazing. Gearing is great, and this engine and gearbox feels really good in this car. So you can crawl nice and slowly camping gear bouncing around in the back there but with the diff locks engaged you can just drive through things nice and easy no problem at all I've got to say one thing about this car even though this has the shortest wheelbase out of the Land Cruiser range the turning circle is not pretty there we go we got it we got it now another test which is interesting to do first gear low range I've locked that into first now with my feet off the pedals, that's actually not too bad. I'm cruising at a decent speed here. It's not super steep, however. I will tell you now that the V8 is absolutely better in that regard. But what the V8 doesn't have that this does is hill descent control. So it doesn't use compression braking. This now uses the brakes and electronics to control progress down a hill. 
And I've got that button on now. The more rusted on four-wheel drivers probably won't like it. They won't appreciate the fact there's hill descent control there, but I mean, for what it's worth, it's doing quite a good job. Still, it's not incredibly slow. I would still prefer the old V8, locked in first gear in low range. That just has amazing compression braking. This is, uh, this is not too bad. But I've got to say, some of the side angles in this car do feel a little bit sketchy from time to time. It's a relatively tall car and it doesn't have an amazing centre of gravity. The articulation from the suspension sometimes, well it goes missing to be honest with you sometimes. So it just feels a little bit like it wants to roll at times in comparison to other vehicles. So in situations like this, you just need to really ease into things a lot. Damn, I've done it. Oh, f that, f that, f that, f that. I'm going to keep going. God damn it. So this here, the car is slipping slightly. So I've just got to ease down this hill. Try and keep my nose pointed in the right direction as well. Without getting on the brakes too much. In first gear, low range. But still... I've got to just use these brakes as much as possible. There, there we go. All right. That was actually steep enough that a little thing came up there on the uh, display to say the engine oil is low. So it was fairly steep there for a moment, but we got through unscathed and well, that's the most important thing, isn't it? Now I couldn't help myself. We've got the GWM Tank 300 out on this shoot. The production guys are using it um, to come along, along the journey, but I've got to see what it's like in comparison to that 70 series, because hey, they're both five seat wagons. They're both off-roaders. They're both got diff locks. A lot in common, actually, when you think about it. Both turbocharged. I just want to see what it's like in direct comparison for this short little stretch here so it's not a full-blown comparison of the 70 but I can tell you right now this car feels a bit more supple straight away it feels lower and wider as well so it's got a bit more of a sense of stability going on in comparison to the 70 of course this car doesn't have to worry about things like towing capacities and payloads so suspension is designed for a different purpose I think in this car but let's just see how we go here hey into the ruts, no diff locks, I'm in low range and I'm also going to stick it into rock mode. Let's see how we go. Oh, there's much less body roll going on here. This is independent front suspension, this Tank 300, in comparison to the 70, but I mean the 70 is not known for its front end articulation anyway. And this car is well, doing it a lot easier actually, to be honest with you. Getting a little bit out of shape there through this rut, but I've actually taken a slightly different line here. So I'm in a bit of a, a bit of a cross axle here, but this car's actually doing quite well. No diff locks yet. In the 70, I had to engage diff locks here. This car is just crawling forward without them. I do have rock mode engaged. There's a parking sensor going off at the back there. There we are, same spot where I was stopped last time. All right, so now let's press some magic buttons. Boom and boom. <laughs> there we go, Diflox for the win once again. How good's that? This Tank 300, it doesn't have to worry about the heavy duty side of things like the 70 does, but man, that was actually pretty good. Now, one thing I'm interested to find out here how this car feels on a downhill side angle in comparison to that Land Cruiser. This isn't as heavily laden at the moment. I'm just going to come down here nice and slow. It feels better. It does feel better. Even though this has 
Got a back wheel lifted up there actually. Even though this has independent front suspension, the 70 series doesn't, I mean, it flexes like a shopping trolley in the front, let's be honest. This feels a little bit more supple and forgiving actually. And it's got coil springs in the rear with a pan hard rod setup in comparison to the leaf springs in the back of the 70 series. Tell you what, if you're wanting to do a bit of recreational four wheel driving, you're only two up. You've maybe got a few bags in the back, not too much gear. This tank is a bit of a surprise packet, I've got to say. Well, the Land Cruiser's come into its own, I think, during this review. On road, around town, let's face it, it's pretty bloody average, but you kind of enjoy the experience as well because this is like the kind of car that is nearly extinct out there and there's nothing really like it left. Some things I do like about it, well, the engine and the gearbox. As much as I might like the V8 in this part of my head, this rational side over here says this is the better setup out of the box. It's easy to drive, it's better to drive, and I've shown today, I think, that off-road, this is every bit capable as it needs to be as a Toyota Land Cruiser, I think. It's actually easier to drive off-road now that it's automatic. But of course, this car comes with so much compromise. The price, the refinement, the comfort, the safety, the technology. Do I need to continue? We know that this is a dinosaur. That's why, on one hand, it's rubbish, but on the other hand, it's special. And I do really like it, once again, on that emotional side of my brain. On the rational side, this does have a place in the world, I think, because it's got big payloads and it's also got a good towing capacity and it is a heavy duty four wheel drive in terms of the mechanicals where a lot of other vehicles have erred towards comfort and that sort of thing with independent front suspension, a lot of other details that have pushed this into a place where it's really on its own. But of course now, I'm at camp. Let me take a seat. The old trusty chair here. I'm going to know a little bit more about this car as well because, well, it's now my home on the road. I am living out of it. So we'll see what this four cylinder is like over the next few days, but I can't think of a more fun car to take out into the bush at the moment. Now, before you go, I have a very selfish request of you. If you've liked this video, hey, even if you haven't, please give us a thumbs up and make sure you subscribe to our channel on YouTube because if you enjoy this video and my bosses see it, they say, hey Sam, you should go out camping and forward driving again because that's really good content. And I say, yes, absolutely, I should do that as well. So please give me a thumbs up. Let me know in the comments below. What do you think about this car? And of course, thanks for watching.